the 2018 Subaru Crosstrek. Built in a zero landfill plant, so you can roam the earth with a lighter footprint. Subaru, proud sponsor of growing a greener world. I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. Food, it's something most of us take for granted. We can have just about anything we want to eat in any proportion we want, any time of the year. And for most of us, we hardly give it a second thought other than what sounds good. But food is something that we eat three times a day, every single day. And when you think about it that way, that's a huge responsibility. From what we buy in the grocery store, to what we plant in the gardens, to the food that we put on our plate. Each and every meal has serious and long lasting implications on our bodies, the economy, and the environment. But more and more people are realizing that the food system in this country has become just too complicated to be sustainable and that a shift is desperately needed. Well, we found a place that's changing the way that communities eat and just maybe changing the way that America thinks about food. The problem with American food culture is that we just we don't have a food culture. But it's because we're a rich agriculture culture. I mean, we came over here to virgin soil and temperate climates and huge geography, huge, you know, unimaginable land masses that, that produce just a heck of a lot of food. And so we weren't forced into the kind of negotiations that peasants in Europe and in Asia were, were forced into for thousands of years. That, that they were eking out what the land could, could, could provide and then making meals and, and eventually cuisine and eventually culture out of that correspondence. I think part of the problem of why we have the lack of food culture we have today is because we were never forced into the kind of decisions that every other culture in the history of the world has been forced into. That's an exceptionally high level way to think about food. But Dan Barber knows food at an exceptionally high level. The world-renowned chef, author, and culinary innovator has won multiple James Beard Awards, served on President Barack Obama's Council on Physical Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition, and has even been named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. And he's a big believer that modern society's appetite for everything from everywhere, no matter the season, is having devastating effects on our bodies and the planet. Unfortunately, we're exporting our diets and our expectations for a plate of food to the rest of the world. That's the problem. That needs to change. I think chefs can do, do something about changing, in part because what I'm really talking about is, is, is a seven ounce piece of protein that centers your plate, you know, twice a day, seven days a week. That's the Western diet, that's the American diet. That's a crazy inefficient system and it's exhaustive on the soil. It's, uh, you know, again, the carrying capacity or just cannot allow that for a growing population. And I'm not an advocate for veganism or vegetarianism, I'm not saying that. We just need to change the architecture plate. How do we think about the future of the world in a healthy, uh, sustainable world? And how can we mimic that on our plate? Well, if you look at all the great cuisines of the world, you look at any other culture in the world, nobody, not a one, has a seven ounce piece of protein as the calling card for, for lunch and dinner seven days a week. It doesn't happen. Dan is now at the forefront of a movement that's both radical within the food industry and yet shockingly simple because it's the way that man lived, farmed, and ate for centuries. Rather than the chef dictating to the farmer what to grow so the chef can display it on his menu, 
the farmer's deciding what to grow based on what the land needs, and that's what the chef has to work with to prepare his meals and dishes in his restaurant. It's way beyond farm-to-table dining. It's farm-driven cuisine. And one of the best examples of that is when Dan flipped the script. When he served steaks, there were actually expertly prepared slabs of parsnips. That's more of a, the parsnip steak was a provocative look and say, look, look, these parsnips are, are, are in the ground for a year. They're, they go through huge cold snaps. They survive, and because they survive, they've converted their starches to sugars. They've got flavor that just knocks you out. And, and why the hell are we putting that as a side dish to a steak? The culture has dictated that. Our culture has dictated that that belongs on the side. It doesn't. And chefs know that. It sings with so much flavor. So I, I created a steak because it was a play on this idea that we can get as much flavor from a parsnip. We flatten it, we make it look like a T-bone, and, uh, and, and we roast it much like a steak, and we serve it with a steak sauce, you know, so that it, and it stands up to it, so that you, you feel satiated and fulfilled. And we serve it actually with a side of meat. But I don't say that in a way that, that, that feels like we're, we're denying people pleasure. In fact, I think if we do the parsnip right, there is no question that that is a more satisfying meal than your steak dinner, no question about it. And we just gotta get that word out there. And this is the epicenter of that revolutionary message. Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture in Pocantico Hills, New York. Less than an hour's drive from the heart of Manhattan, Blue Hill at Stone Barns has become a bucket list restaurant for foodies from the big city and one of the top dining destinations in the world. It's an experience unlike any other, an epic four hour meal that some nights comprises more than 30 courses. And there is no menu at Blue Hill. Dan and his team serve what's been produced in the gardens right on the property or within a short drive. It's food that couldn't possibly be more local. One of the problems with, with the assumption is that we need, Ameri we need a new American cuisine. That's where we run into trouble. That's all wrong. That's like, I mean, Italy has, has 150 different interpretations of risotto, literally based on towns, like that's micro-region. What we need actually is, is regional cuisines that celebrate these microclimates. What people are looking for today is what is it about this restaurant that, that gives us a good illustrative example of what, what is this region. The drive for local is really led by chefs. It's because it's giving the diner not just exceptional flavor, but an exceptional experience that you can't get elsewhere. That's a, a, just a mind change for restaurants and for the food culture in general. Without the 80 acres of four season farmland at Stone Barns, the restaurant simply wouldn't exist. And this new way of looking at food and farming in our society would fall flat. It takes a special individual to step up to that kind of challenge. Jack Algier has been the farm director here since 2003. The grasslands that are around me right here are part of what we call a four course rotation. Uh, another name for it is a lay rotation like the lay of the land, the, the open grass space. And the idea of this rotation is to have as few inputs as possible, really just seed and sheep uh, or other grazers. Uh, we go many years in pasture, five, five years in pasture, to one year in grain, a season in legumes, and a year in vegetables. And those four courses kind of move around and make the place uh, more productive that's really the long-term resilience of the place is when the soils improve on their own and when the production increases with the cycles that we have. Really feeding the soil rather than feeding the plant. Um, that over time builds the biome, it builds this really living system. It's an unconventional approach compared to what many commercial farmers tend to do, but Jack has never been afraid to fly in the face of convention. In fact, he made waves at Stone Barns before he even clocked in on his very first day. When you got here, you showed up to the gate on your first day of work. <laughs> and you were behind what? I was behind a chemical truck. I was behind an herbicide truck, which was really funny because you know, I hadn't met anybody at this place yet. And so I stopped and I could tell it was a chemical truck. So I got out and asked the guy what he was up to and he said he was about to spray rodeo on all the Phragmites here down in the wetlands. 
thought, oh no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> this is my first day on the, you know, managing an organic farm. You know? So I said, no, I don't think really you're in the right place. I don't think you're going to get in any trouble if you get back in your truck and just go back home. And I'll, we'll make a call, I'll help you out here. And I still hadn't even gone inside a building yet. This is you haven't my, even reported it. I hadn't. So I, you know, so then I find my way in. I thought, whoa, this is this is kind of a strange start. So I walk into this board meeting full of all the designers and architects and everybody. And I said, hey, you know, I just had to kick a, a herbicide truck off the property. And they were like, who are you again? <laughs> <laughs> Energetically, the place was looking for somebody, a risk taker, I guess. Mm -hmm. One example of those risks? Installing a massive greenhouse on top of a half acre of open soil in an untested attempt at true four season farming. This is a functioning living ecosystem with a protection around it, not a plant warehouse. So it's a very different way to consider greenhouse operations and growing. In fact, when we got to actually build the house with the professionals that came to help with this house, uh, they had never built a greenhouse like this on top of open soil and weren't even sure how to build it with a living soil on the floor. So I had to oversee the building of this house and impose a method of farming on the inside. And I thought, what a huge risk this is going to be. So here's a very expensive space meant for industrial systems and we're going to put in a design that is truly a resilient, holistic kind of design. And I'd have to say after 14 years of doing this, of zero spray, we see high diversity, constant year-round production in a system that's cold. So in the winter in here, it's only 32 degrees. We allow it to get to cold chill. Um, we have three cycles of rotation that go across the entire season. The crops change in each one of those major seasons. And it takes 10 years and 50 crops for the rotation to return to the same spot. But for Jack, it's not really about growing vegetable crops. It's about building the healthiest soil possible. The soil is the first thing. The ecology of the space is the first thing to think about. It's, the ecology is the slowest to adapt. So we, wanna, we really want to stabilize that and make it more productive for us. Once we have that in place and we know essentially the right families of crops that we can put into place, then the dialogue begins with our customer. Maybe something like, I made this dish and the vegetable was really delicious, but it wasn't the right size, or maybe, maybe it would be more suited like this, or it gave me the inspiration to make this new recipe. And then we adapt by saying, you know what, actually there's another variety we can choose. There's another timing we can apply here. So rather than having a farmer over here, and a chef over here, and an educator over here, it's a we. Right. We like to blur that line. We like to know each other's space. We don't necessarily want to do each other's job, but we appreciate each other. Mm -hmm. And in that appreciation is a mimicry of what's actually happening in the whole of nature, how things sort of tone together. Well, Jack thinks like a chef. We become obsessed with how we're putting together a dish. Like, okay, a recipe, how do we take ingredients put together? But it's infinitely more interesting actually to suggest that that's way too late. It's like the way to put together a recipe, the way to write a recipe is from the ground up. I wouldn't suggest to you that he's sitting there making these decisions, thinking about you know how it's going to affect the kitchen and the, I don't. I actually think he's just driven by by creating the best possible soil environment, best possible environment for his crops. And it just is a nice thing that that by definition means that we're going to get the best flavored stuff into the kitchen. Or in other words, it's the land that should dictate what we eat instead of our taste dictating what we grow. That philosophy is shared by Dan's brother, David, who co-owns the restaurant. 
if you are building soil health and getting food as a, as a byproduct of that exercise and you're able to sustain the population that you want to sustain through that work, then, then that is sustainable. That, that can be done in perpetuity. There's not enough of people going to farmers and saying, what I really want to buy is your demonstration of long-term sustainable ag agriculture, your demonstration of real stewardship of this land for generations, and prove to me that you're doing that. And whatever the offtake is from that process that you need me to buy uh, to, to make sure that you continue to do that and that your children continue to do that as farmers, I'll buy it and I'll, I'll eat it and enjoy it and it should and will be delicious. You know, we, that's one of the reasons we don't have menus. This doesn't work economically. Uh, if people come in here and start ordering. We're, we're buying everything that this farm and several other farms that we partner with, everything they produce uh, to support their entire rotation and their entire operation. And our job is to make people eat it and, and find that process enjoyable and delicious and, and for what we're charging somewhat hedonistic and, and really wonderful. That's the, that's the job of the, of the kitchen and the chefs and the creativity. But the core of the ingredient is celebrating um, agriculture that is doing that kind of work. David mentioned price, and it's something you have to talk about when you talk about a meal at Blue Hill. For all the incredible work being done in both the fields and the kitchen, and for the larger importance of the message that they're working hard at Stone Barns to teach. Enjoying dinner here is a privilege to be sure. That four-hour meal with no menu is around $250 per person. But at that price point, David says that they're actually ensuring that their customers are the ones willing to invest in the mission and help spread the word long after they pay the check. We are in an extremely wealthy part of the country and, and we sit in Westchester County. By and large, they are of that you know 1% of the 1% and, and that is our audience. Here, we've made it clear to people that if they come, they're you know, making an investment of time. Most of the people uh, coming, are it's a big event for them. It's a, it's a pilgrimage of sorts. They're not you know, going to the movies afterwards or have other plans. They're here for the night. They want to spend a, a considerable amount of time with us, an above average amount of time, even for fine dining, um, to really understand the stories and the thinking behind the food that's on their plate. But the work at Stone Barn Center is about much more than simply growing food to be turned into gourmet meals in this one ultra-high-end restaurant. A primary thrust of the mission is educational, teaching aspiring farmers and chefs how to duplicate these techniques and take these farming and cooking methods out into the world to spread the message and hopefully kickstart a widespread change in how America thinks about food. So we've had more than a million visitors since Stone Barns came into existence and we're really counting on those visitors to take ideas or just like a germ of an idea back to their own community and think about food in their life, food in their school, food in their hospital. Putting a kid out in the fields with a really vibrant farmer or in the kitchen with an amazing young chef and creating an experience for them that they want to repeat. So having them come here and experience food in a way that makes them go home and say, I want more of that. That's exactly what happened for Jason Grauer. Fresh out of college with an economics degree, Jason had launched a promising and lucrative career in finance. But a little weekend volunteer work at Stone Barns sparked something unexpected. When I pulled a carrot from the ground for the first time, I felt like a four-year-old, even though at the time I was a 24-year-old. It was a self-exploration. It was every week doing a little bit more, a little bit more, going home and being so overcome with interest and curiosity about what is a carrot, what is soil, what are, what are we talking about here? There was so much there. What, what is it to be a human being? What are the things that are important to understand as a human being? Honestly, like this is as deep as it got. And so. <laughs> Having those degrees and going through a traditional education, I didn't feel personally that I had, when I got out of college, that I had what I was deeming real life skills, like a real understanding of the things, the basic needs that I was using every single day. 
don't know how to build anything, don't know how to grow anything, I don't know where food comes from. <laughs> Jason walked away from the Wall Street fast track and is now the crop production manager at Stone Barns, spending his days on the cutting edge of biodynamic farming and teaching those skills to a new generation of growers. What was a life, literally a life changing event yeah, for you? Definitely. Picking a carrot was a life changing event. What's most alive for us here is our production farm, being able to host an educational piece with young farmers. So during their time here, they get about 300 hours of actual class time. So that's a, a, a class a week based on things like technical, uh, carpentry, welding, fencing. Then there's about a third of that that's based on the sciences, things like soil science and plant science and pathology. And so we base that sort of other third on business planning, farm visioning, learning ways to access land such as leasing, really giving farmers and people the tools to be able to have this a continuum in their life. One farm, trying to change the way an entire nation eats and thinks about food. It's a monumental undertaking, one that might seem impossible. But if you spend even part of a day at Stone Barn Center, whether it's walking the grounds on a free tour, taking part in a hands-on workshop, or sitting down to a once-in-a-lifetime meal at Blue Hill, you come away with the impression that changing the American food system is absolutely possible. That passionate optimism may be the most important thing being grown here at Stone Barns, and it's evident everywhere you look. Often the question is, well, this is all very nice, but how are you going to feed the world or something like this? And that's not really the, the objective. The, the objective is to how do you rebuild communities? That's how we feed ourselves. That's how we learn and how we make better choices. The, the farmers won't solve that problem for the rest of the world. But we all eat, and it's our place to make a big change. The nice thing about the food movement is that it's really rooted in this pleasure and hedonism and that if we're greedy, which Americans are quite good at, if we're greedy for the right things, we can both have our cake and eat it too in the sense that we can have this great pleasurable experience and engagement with food but also improve the, the environmental workings around us. Flavor is, is the truth teller because like I, you cannot have that jaw-dropping delicious carrot without the right kind of environmental stewardship uh, um, uh, decisions behind it. It's just impossible. You can have a carrot, but you can't have the jaw-dropping carrot that you can taste for five minutes after you swallow it. That's the key, that's the permanence of something that is grown in the right way. You know, that's, that's the beauty of a well-grown vegetable, a perfectly rotated grain, an animal that's fed in the right way, that's, that's, that's lived, lived a good and prosperous life on grass. All those things translate into the gift of nature, which is, which is this, this flavor that stays with you. It's one of the great pleasures of life. Here at Stone Barn Center in Blue Hill, we had such a wonderful opportunity to meet so many great people we're all dedicated to sharing that message about creating more sustainable food systems by shortening that supply chain through farm-driven cuisine and sourcing those ingredients more locally and regionally while helping us to think differently about every meal that we eat. And at Stone Barns and Blue Hill, they're also training up tomorrow's leaders who are adding their voice to help guide us in putting the culture back in agriculture in more sustainable ways. Now, we have a lot more information on our website under the show notes for this episode. Website address, that's the same as our show name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm Joe Lample, and we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World.